Hello, Internet. We are live. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 64 of the Stanford MOS Seminar Series. I'm Kern, and as always, we have with us Dan Fu, uh, Piero, Fyodor, and our guest today, Xin Yu Hu from uh, Uber. So um, we also have another guest who I think will be arriving uh, at some point during the talk, but um, a little bit about this seminar. So uh, we're going to do a 30 minute talk followed by a 30 minute podcast style discussion where you in the YouTube uh, audience can ask questions in the live chat and we'll uh, put those questions to our uh, speakers today. Uh, you can also keep those questions coming during the talk and we'll keep track of them and, and get those across uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, and a little bit about our speakers today. So Shinyu is a senior research scientist at Uber. Uh, where she's focusing on large-scale machine learning uh, in spatial temporal problems and causal inference. Um, and she got her PhD uh, from Columbia. Um, and then we also have Olje, who is a staff research scientist at Uber, um, who is going to be joining as well. And he worked on ads at Google before this. Um, and today we're going to hear about um, estimated time of arrivals and how to predict them uh, at Uber. So uh, Shinyu, you can take it away. Sure. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm glad to be here to talk about the PT project and how Uber predicts the arrival time using deep learning. So you may all have used the Uber app before. And uh, when you type in the destination in the app, you can see an estimate time of arrival on your phone. That's the ETA we're talking about today. So at Uber, magical experience um, depends on the accurate arrival time prediction. We use CTA to calculate fares, estimate uh, pickup times, and match riders to drivers, plan deliveries, and many more. So let's first take a look at a few examples. When a ride, uh, rider requests a ride trip, an ETA show up. This ETA will affect the price estimate on the right seat in the app. And it's also used to optimize matching in which we match close by drivers and rider to dispatch a trip. There is also ETA for pickup and drop up trips. Similar for Uber Eats, the ETA affects matching on dispatching pricing and also eater consumer uh, experiences. Uh, Uber rides and its ETA improvements have million dollar headroom globally since improving ETA prediction can lead to better conversion, fewer cancellation, better matching efficiency, and more accurate pricing. But the question is how to do the prediction. The ETA prediction task is predicting the travel time from origin to destination we have a routing engine that generates a predicted route line and travel time from an origin A to a destination B. Traditional routing engines compute ETAs by dividing up the road network into small road segments represented by weighted edges in a graph. And they use the short shortest path algorithm to find the best path through the graph and add up the weights to derive an ETA. But as, uh, as we all know, the map is not uh, the terrain. A road graph is just a model. It cannot perfectly capture the condition on the ground. Uh, so the routing engine service is very fast, but the accuracy is, is pretty low due to the following reasons. First, the route compliance. Drivers may not take the recommended routes from the routing engine. Therefore, there is constantly rerouting happening, which affect the ETA accuracy. And the ride trip and deliver trip have different routes also. And in the beginning and at the end of the trip, there is always some like uncontrollable event, for example, finding a parking lot, or um, there are some like road closure, etc. Uh, et so all this reason uh, may affect um, the performance from the routing engine. And to improve the ETA, we use a hybrid approach of ETA post-processing. That is, you use the routing engine ETA while build a post-processing service on top of it. The map data traffic signal goes through the routing engine. The post-processing model um, before we output to the routing APIs. 
Here we choose to use deep learning to build the post-processing system with strict requirements. For example, the model must return an ETU within a few milliseconds at most with high accuracy. And the model must provide ETA predictions globally across all Uber lines of business, such as uh, the mobility and delivery. So in this talk, we will cover how to make the prediction accurate, fast, and general. So the ETA prediction is actually a regression problem. The final ETA we want to predict is from the beginning of the trip to the end of the trip. But the beginning and end location neighborhoods of the trip count for a large portion of noise, as we mentioned. So the routing engine ETA circumvent this uncertainty by estimating the travel time between the neighborhoods instead of the actual beginning and add location. Therefore, we propose to predict the, the residual on top of the routing engine ETA instead of um, predicting the end-to-end, beginning-to-end ETA. This figure illustrates the difference between the routing engine ETA and the final ETA we uh, want. The rides and the delivery trip have a very different residual distribution and uh, uh, that is illustrated in the figure on the right-hand side. And also the residual is highly skewed. So predicting ETA accurately is actually very challenging. For several years, Uber used um, gradient boosting decision tree examples to refine the ETA prediction, but it has reached its limits. So the DPTA team has made several efforts to make it uh, the, to make the ETA prediction more accurate, fast, and more general. So we have tried several um, model architectures and uh, uh, for example, the MLP, the node, the tabnet, the transformer, linear transformer, the, and the best structure um, is shown on the right-hand side in the figure. Uh, that is what we use so far. Uh, next, let's dive into the details of this model architecture. So the model inputs are the maps data, the traffic data, and the output from the routing engine. We first do some preprocessing and then embed all features. Then we use a, then we use a linear self-attention layer to learn special temporal feature interaction before go through fully connected layer and calibration layer to predict the residual. And once we have this residual, we'll add the residual on top of the output from the routing engine. And uh, the final ETA is forced to be positive. So um, feature and embedding are actually the most important uh, components are in the DPTA model. The feature we use include some like time features such as the minute of day, day of week, some location feature like the uh, location of the beginning and end trips, and also traffic feature, for example, some real time speed. The DPDA model embeds all the categorical features and bucketize all continuous features before embed them. We treat geospatial special feature differently the reason is that the location data is distributed very unevenly across the globe. Um, the location data is uh, distributed very evenly over the globe and contains information at multiple spatial resolutions. We therefore quantize the location into multiple resolution grids based on the longitude and latitude as shown in the left figure. Um, as the resolution increases, the number of distinct grid cells grows exponentially, and the average amount of data in each grid cell decreases proportionally. So we also introduce some like multiple feature hash at each resolution to keep the cardinality under control and neglect the effects of hash collision and also help regularize the model. After feature embedding, we use self-attention layers to model feature interactions. Many people are already very familiar with the transformer architecture. In a language model, 
each vector represent a single word token. But in the case of DPTA, each vector represent a single feature, such as the origin of the trip or the time of the day. Therefore, the self-attention we use this model is permutation invariant operation, and that maps the sequences of the vector to some reweighted sequence of vectors. And when the self-attention layer process each feature, it looks at every other feature in the input for clues and output the representation of the feature as a weighted sum. Through this way, we can kind of bake the understanding of all the temporal and spatial features into one feature currently processed. Um, while the original transformer layer provides good accuracy, but it was too slow to meet the latency requirement for online real-time serving due to the quadratic time complexity in the attention metric calculation. Therefore, after trying out a few new methods to linearize the operation, we apply the linear transformer to speed up the computation. Another secret to make DPT fast is to utilize feature sparsity. While the model has hundreds of millions of parameters, any one prediction touches only a tiny fraction of them roughly like 0.25%. Um, how do you achieve this? First of all, the model itself is relatively shallow. The vast majority of the parameter exists in embedding lookup tables. By, by discretizing the inputs and mapping them to embedding, we avoid evaluating any of the unused embedding table parameters. And discretizing the input give us a clear speed up at serving time compared to alternative implementations. So, um, and also it's important because we need to meet the production serving requirements. This post-processing system has a highest QPS request uh, at Uber and need to be stable when handling different QPS loads. So our current model has a median latency about three million seconds and 95 um, percentile latency is about four milliseconds, so it's uh, pretty fast. And as we discussed, the system serves many product lines at Uber. One of the design goal of DPTA is to provide a general ETA model that serves all of Uber's lines of business across the globe. This can be challenging because different lines of business have different needs and different data distributions. So we first use a uh, Asymmetric loss to balance the trade off among different metrics like the MAEs, uh, the P95 arrow, the buyers for different products. And then we use a calibration layer to adjust bias for different request type, for example, the, the delivery trip and the right trip, and whether it's a long trip or a short trip, whether it's a pickup trip or drop up trip. And also, um, this calibration is done across uh, global through different macro regions. Um, the DPDA system has shown um, significant improvement in online and offline experience and is actually the current production model at Uber. So in the offline experiments, we compare uh, the DPTA with three other alternative methods. The evaluation metrics are the relative error improvement from the routing engine ETA, specifically we evaluate the relative MAE, relative P95 arrow, and relative P95 uh, arrow. DPTA uh, has actually um, achieved the lowest MAE and the P50 arrow uh, as shown in this table. And for the P95 arrow, DPTA with and without feature hashing actually has pretty similar um, performance. And this result indicates that once we have richer geospatial embeddings that can improve the performance in typical cases, but may not improve extreme errors and compare DPTA with um, its other variants like without calibration um, by removing them actually see degradation. So uh, they are mm, two important components in the model to improve the model performance. Uh, the uh, ETAs of the delivery and the rise request have quite different distribution. Um, so 
we also evaluate the ETA prediction for uh, rise and the really separately. Interestingly, the rise request has a significant lower um, P50 arrow and delivery request has significant lower um, P95 arrow. In addition, uh, we analyze the experiment's result um, for major cities globally. So overall, you can see uh, different cities have different performance. And uh, uh, for example, uh, New York, that's improved um, the most from the DPTA model among these four cities. We also uh, select a few geospatial embeddings and uh, temporal embeddings and project them separately onto two dimensional space using TISNI. And we can observe that, for example, the time embedding, the minute of wake embedding has some like local continuity and is a one dimensional manifold. The geo hash embedding are locally clustered based on the geo location. The pattern is similar for the rides trip and the delivery trip. So uh, there is more exciting work in progress. For example, um, we are trying out um, better on um, model the traffic information and use graph learning for route embeddings. So please check out our blog post and feel free to reach out. DPD is a really big project OJ and I are presenting today, but we want to acknowledge all the colleagues who have contributed to the, the project. So these are the team who has contributed to this um, project and make it happen at Uber. So thanks, uh, that's all for me. Uh, Karan, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I, I muted my mic. Sorry. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Neil, for that talk. And uh, um, yeah, I think we'll have a, a ton of questions. I'm definitely curious to dig into some of those uh, details. Um, a reminder to folks in the audience, uh, please uh, send in your questions on the YouTube chat and we'll uh, get those across um, to our speakers today. And also, I, I just want to uh, call out that um, OJ has uh, joined as well. So uh, welcome. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll uh, definitely have you answer a few of these questions too. So um, thanks for thanks for joining. Um, okay, so I guess to kick things off, um, uh, one of the things I'm curious about is how do you um, think about sort of reacting to changes in, you know, the physical world, like things like uh, you know, one week there's maybe construction somewhere and like, uh, you know, roads closed down and there's like maybe, uh, you know, like uh, just a couple of days ago, they closed down my entire street and like put up put up these like orange uh, uh, things from PG&E to, you know, not park there, et cetera, et cetera, which definitely increased uh, the arrival time because I was using Uber Eats. So <laughs> this is a little bit of a, a personal experience. Um, so I'm just curious how you react to those changes because, you know, things are changing kind of constantly and, and what... What part of your model handles that, or is there retraining that happens that kind of accommodates that? Yeah, so definitely, as I mentioned, uh, there are a lot of like uh, reward situation can happen when we predict uh, the ETA. So for example, the road closure, as you mentioned. So uh, in our model, we do have like um, historical features um, to model that. And in the meanwhile, we have the uh, real time feature, the traffic feature, for example, um, the if there is some like a situation happening in real time, and we have like um, some feature like real time speed and uh, uh, versus the historical speed that can capture that ongoing changes. Now, in addition, if there's some road changes, actually that's the reason why the road engine ETA may not better capture the. The, the 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 true ETA because it cannot take into account all the signals at once. So uh, we have this post processing part just to, to take care of it. And yeah, I think it's sorry. That, yeah, that's a that's a great answer. One of the things that you know I was curious about when you were giving going through you know all the components was, um, and maybe this is a higher level question, but you know the complexity of just the way in which things are built. You know, obviously like. Uh, for people on the academic side, maybe it's a little uh, less familiar in, the, in some sense because, you know, you have all of these different moving parts that are plugging into each other and, and kind of 
uh, almost like a, a behemoth <laughs> a model constructed out of that. So I'm just curious, kind of, you know, what was the progression of um, of the you know ETA model over time? Like, I'm sure you you started uh, at at some point uh, with with something much much simpler and uh, and kept some of those pieces. So I'm just curious how that kind of evolution happened. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to answer that yeah. one actually because it's it's not something that was covered in the talk. Yeah. Um, but this. This has been going on for a long time, like this project. And it started out, uh, Uber was using a lot of very weak tree-based models that were trained for each city to uh, sort of improve the ETAs coming from the routing engine. And uh, one of the things I, I noticed about this was that it wasn't really improving all that much. And uh, I was pushing the team that owned these models to sort of increase the depth of the trees they were using at the very least so that you would have better uh, spatial resolution. And uh, there was a ton of pushback uh, against that. And, and people were throwing all this stuff at me like, hey, haven't you heard of weak learnability? Like, you, you don't need to like go deep, you just need lots of weak little trees. But in practice, that's not uh, good advice for uh, practitioners, because you're not training an infinite series of trees, you're, you're really just training a, a limited ensemble. Uh, so after a lot of pushing, they, they increased the depth of the trees and actually improved performance quite a bit. Uh, but then that made things a lot more challenging for us when we wanted to you know, push to switch to deep learning because we had created this behemoth model that was ended up being like the largest model at Uber. Um, and initially like the first uh, version of DPTA didn't even have as many parameters as this very large XGBoost model, but it was still outperforming it. So that says something. Um, I don't know if that if that fully answers your question or if there was more. Maybe Shin, you had more stuff to add. No, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think uh, some of the other things I was curious to dig into were um, around, you know, like uh, some some of the stuff around feature hashing and like um, how to how to kind of discretize this spatial grid in some sense. Like that seems like a pretty major uh, kind of design decision that that feels like it probably happened over multiple iterations because it, it seems feels complicated from from at least my point of view yeah so for the the geospatial feature hashing so yeah as, as Shinyu pointed out like the the data is very unevenly distributed and geospatial data it doesn't obey the same smoothness characteristics as you know simple continuous features and in particular, as you sample more and more geospatial data, there's more and more detail that, that emerges, right? And you want to be able to capture that detail. But if you use like a very fine grid and, and learn an embedding at each grid cell, then you end up overfitting in the less dense areas. Uh, and so that presented a challenge. And so what we were doing initially was that we were computing a, a grid uh, and we were just indexing all of the grid cells that would appear in a random sample of the, the training data. And it, it seemed that as we kept increasing the size of that sample that we use to, to learn these embeddings, performance was improving, but then a funny thing happened, performance started to degrade as we started increasing the size of that. So the model ended up overfitting as we uh, you know, learned a one-to-one -one mapping from these grid cells to, to uh, embeddings. And so, and the other thing was that it was consuming a ton of memory. You know, as Shinyu pointed out, like there's an exponential increase right. in um, the, the memory consumption as you increase the resolution. So, you know, with the feature hashing, it started out to solve, we were trying to solve this problem. We're using too much memory and training is too slow and, and so forth. But it turned out that when you have multiple hashes, you're actually doing better than uh, you are with with simple indexing like that. Um, and then the other interesting thing, and this sort of comes out of the results, is that transformers seem to do better with this multiple independent feature hashing. Uh, and they do a better job extracting the signal from the multiple feature hashes than any of the other architectures. And you can think about uh, why this is. It's because um, if you think about these independent hash buckets, uh, the embedding that you're looking for is mixed into each of these buckets. And you consider the uh, points that are colliding in there as noise. So when, when the, the transformer is computing these dot products, it's in effect denoising uh, across those independent hash buckets. And, and so I think that's why transformers work so well for, for this type of uh, setup. 
Awesome. Yeah, no, that was a, that was a great, uh, I guess, answer. And, and just, uh, you know, nice to have that context on, uh, on how things came about. Um, Piero, I think, wanted to ask a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, again, thank you both for the presentation and for the details, which I really, you know, uh, this is like really that things that, you know, our audience really crave for because, you know, uh, people putting models into production have to consider all these things, right? But I also think that there's another aspect that, you know, I think the audience will be really happy to, um, to discover more about and is the fact that, and, you know, in the presentation, Shinyu really touched upon the um, P50 and P95, but I'm curious about the um, production constraints and how you work with them, around them, and how that shaped also the final solution that you ended up uh, putting in production. OJ, do you want to take this or? Product okay, so the production constraints, so the, when we set out to do this project, there was a lot of uh, skepticism around uh, deep learning. And people, people said to us, and I won't say who, they, they said, okay, if you want to get us to switch to deep learning, you have to provide a model that outperforms in terms of accuracy, but uh, has the same latency profile as the XGBoost model. And uh, you can't change anything else about the, the data. You have to use the same data set, everything. And the hardest thing was getting this latency profile constraint met. And uh, we were able to beat on accuracy, but then the, it was too slow. And this is actually, I think, Shinu, you really need to tell this story because this you, you really saved the day here with your work on the fast transformer. Yeah, I think the major bottleneck is their serving latency. So I have tried a lot of things just in, to improve the serving latency. So for example, uh, as I mentioned, several things we first uh, tested transformer state works pretty well, but since uh, the latency test does not pass, so we have to switch to a better structure so that it can compute fast. So we tried several versions of like wire rates of transform like performer, <laughs> link former, linear transformer. So like several things just want to make sure we can pass the latency test. And also we kind of have to rely heavily on the embedding layers instead of like build several, like build a really deep neural network just to improve the, 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 the accuracy. So there are a lot of things and it's really a team effort and we have spent a lot of time just to improve the latency by like one millisecond, for example. So. Yeah, and I was surprised, uh, you know, people post a uh, big O notation of how complex their uh, model is in terms of runtime efficiency. And, uh, you know, I read this paper by Katarapoulos, the, the Transformers are RNNs, linear transformer paper. And they're claiming this linear runtime in terms of the input. And I was skeptical. I remember asking Shinji, is this really faster than a fully connected layer? Like, are you sure? Like, it's not just, you know, there's some hidden, uh, cost like a, but it turned out to be faster and uh, it really saved the day. Like we, it was the difference between okay, you get to launch and you don't get to launch. But yeah, after we cool. got that initial launch, it, it was like oh well, you know this model is actually generating money for the company and like we could just throw more resources at the serving layer, right? It's just that because of that initial skepticism around deep learning, they really wanted us to clear that hurdle. Okay, you got to do everything better and just <laughs> with the same resource footprint and everything. Yeah, sometimes it's more, it's more about how easy can you show value before then putting more investment rather than you know, directly tackling the final, the final goal, right? So that's, that's, that's super, I, mean, I think it's, it's a great learning. Thank you for sharing it. One of the things I was curious about in your talk was you mentioned all these kind of sources of error for a, uh, for an ETA announcement, like traffic is an obvious one, but also things like finding a parking lot at the end or things like that. When you're kind of developing these models and going in day to day and trying to make them better, how do you kind of triage those errors and figure out exactly where they're coming from? Yeah, that's actually a good question. So in real world, it's really hard to capture all this error because it's kind of unobserved to us because we may not know whether this driver has a difficult time finding a parking lot or there are just some like road on under construction. So 
Um, so I guess uh, the main, th there are like two major ways in industry to deal with uh, DTA prediction. One is through some sort of graph learning, just model the routes uh, as uh, connected edges in a graph. And the other is through some like, like uh, some post-processing way. So for the graph model itself, it actually um, kind of um, hard to deal with all the like issue cost, uh, cost this rerouting, but for post-processing, we actually, it's just a, a light layer just uh, built on top of the existing, for example, the graph uh, network or the routing engine so that we can take into consider all the information you mentioned by features and uh, through adding like feature on um, some historical feature, real-time feature, we can kind of um, better, um, modeling the situation, for example, at um, for one particular road, if at the last week we did the, for the last trip, there are some like um, reason causing the driver having a hard time finding the, the, the parking lot, maybe for the like the, the next Monday, this may still happen, right? So just, there are always um, kind of like traffic information and uh, additional feature we can utilize to to capture those kind of information. Cool. This actually reminds me of a question that I saw in the YouTube chat, which is so because you're kind of just doing this residual estimate uh, at the end, is there any opportunity for using that and feeding it back into like a routing system or like um, like a navigation system to maybe uh, maybe like the, the like the Google Maps prediction isn't as good as yours for for predicting an ETA. Is there any opportunity to kind of feed that back and give a driver uh, a some feedback on like where they should go or what route they should take? Uh, I think the goal is kind of uh, different here. So for the, for example, for the first approach of using the routing engine or a graph uh, structure, I, as you mentioned, the, the big issue is whether there will be a rerouting. Um, so um, I guess when, as long as the, the routing um, component, um, sorry, the route component is fixed actually, um, using like deep learning models to, to estimate, for example, ETA for each uh, segment is not that challenging. So the, from past, more, my perspective, the biggest challenge come from the routes. So, but in our case, our goal is kind of model some sort of residual. So um, it's not like directly related to routes. So I guess the information we capture here is a little bit different from uh, the one like optimizing the the routing. Yeah, I I also wonder. So sometimes when I take an Uber, I see uh, they'll uh, either ignore the the Uber navigation or pick up a Waze or a Google Maps or something. How do you take things like that into account? Like maybe you don't even know what route the the driver is going to take. That's the primary thing that DPPA is solving for is route uncertainty. And uh, yeah, so, so a lot of routing engines, like even Google Maps, they give you an ETA that's conditional on the route that they provided for you. Uh, and if you wanted to account for route uncertainty, one way is you could generate a bunch of potential routes and like marginalize out that uncertainty, or you could take a data-driven approach like us and you know just do an end-to-end -end prediction of the ETA. Gotcha, I'd, I'd be really curious to see like at what point does that, uh, like, you know, uncertainty change, because if I'm going to, you know, if, if I'm in the Bay Area, I'm picking between 280 and 101. Um, at some point, you you know which one you're going on based on uh, wh which route you took. Um, so I'd be really curious, like, if the model kind of knows if there's like some way of quantifying that uncertainty and the model kind of knows when when that switch happens. Well, we're generating an ETA every four seconds if you're on a trip, but the way that we score ourselves is basically how well can you predict at the beginning of the trip? So that when mm -hmm. I talk about route uncertainty, that's that's what I mean. Gotcha. I think there's also another interesting aspect that is derived from this, which is, um, you know, the, the because you're predicting the residual, um, it's very, that the residual is very, very, you know, dependent on the original value, right? If the original value for ETA was changes, like the, the, the engine that is providing that changes a lot, 
then you need to adapt that to a certain extent, right? But if you're taking into account many routing engines or many potential ways to um, predict the DTA, then those things get kind of averaged out to a certain extent, right? Yeah, it, there is this dependency on you know the underlying system. So if the underlying system changes, you know you might need to retrain your model. But I mean, there's ways to to handle that in practice because we know when those changes happen. So we can basically annotate the data and say this data came from this version and that data came from that version. Right, and I think the advantage potentially of having a deep learning model here is that you can quickly like reuse the same weights and potentially fine tune on the new changes, right, rather than retraining the model from scratch also. Piero, that leads nicely into kind of a question that I had. Um, so one of the really nice pieces of the system that you mentioned was that it can extend to many different um, ETA prediction tasks that you have at Uber. I was curious if um, everything in the system needs to be tuned and retrained every time you expand into a different city or are there components of this that are actually kind of general or reusable across all the areas Uber serves? So, sorry. So, um, yeah, so definitely there is a reusable part. For example, in our case, um, we actually, uh, first our data is uh, global data. So we already have a rich sample to learn some like um, like global level effect. And uh, so that kind of information capturing the embedding actually can be reused if we actually going to launch in new cities. Uh, and uh, secondly, I think as we build this geo hash embedding, we actually use different granularity. Say um, we can the granularity can be at city level, at uh, region level, or even like within a few blocks. So that kind of information also can capture um, the the difference. So if we have rich data points in certain area, we can capture that point. But if we don't have that. Actually, we just look at the bigger grid on in the geo hash, then use that as average uh, information for the small area without too too much data. This might be a good time. I I saw a very similar question in the YouTube chat. Um, so maybe we can jump to to some of the questions from the YouTube chat. Um, so kind of starting from the, the top, uh, a Savary who I, I hope that I'm, I'm pronouncing that right. Um, says, thanks for the talk. Uh, the, her question is, is the model deployed, um, on phones or is it, are the results kind of, uh, fetched from a server or something like that? Um, and kind of what are the, the latency, uh, constraints when you're looking at, uh, thinking about deploying in either of those settings? It's, it's a backend model. Uh, so it's not on the, the phone. And so there's a, a big, the highest sort of QPS service at Uber is uh, getting requests and passing them to the routing engine, fetching these features and, and producing the predictions. But the, the second part of the question was the latency. Yeah, what are kind of the latency concerns, I guess, um, for, for deploying that, that model? Yeah, because it has to power a lot of decisions. Like when you make a trip request, you're not just computing one ETA, you're computing many, many ETAs because there could be different cars that we could match you to and so forth. Uh, and those services have to meet very strict SLAs so that they can return results and, and everything. So it, it's a, few, a few milliseconds is what we have to adhere to, which is pretty tight. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, because... It, you have to you have to tell the the customer like when the Uber is supposed to be there and then when they're gonna be be at the uh, their final location and I, I guess there's uh, all that going into it. Um, another question from Ening Chen: uh, How do you reduce the volatility of prediction? Uh, for example, if it predicts like twenty minutes at the beginning of the drive um, and then forty minutes once once you get started or, or something like that. I don't quite, I don't, I'm not sure I get this question correct. The variability do you mean comes from 
before at the beginning of a trip and versus in the middle of a trip or it's just a uh, other I think it's probably about about the timing, right? When when you do the predictions, is it probably anything tying the predictions for the same ride over time together or not? And if not, uh, do you do account for that or not? Account for different time. Um, yeah. So, so for example, we do have this um feature to differentiate between. The, the request. So for example, some is at um, pre-trip before the trip happening, um, for example, are waiting to be picked up and some is during the trip. Um, so we do have a different indicator, have a, fe a feature of um, indicator um, to um, indicator whether um, it's um, at which parts of the trip that is. So basically, I guess, to answer the question, we account for the variability by using features on um, include features in the model. Yeah, I would add like the, the classical thing to do in, in this case would be to use like a common filter that tracks like the last ETA and like tries to update its beliefs about what the ETA will be. But we're not using any kind of sequential model uh, right now uh, for, for on-trip predictions. But it's an interesting thought. Um, yeah, but as Shuni pointed out, like if the features aren't there to, if they're not in the model, it's not going to be able to take that into account. I guess the the other bit would be, uh, is the model like very volatile at all, or is it uh, kind of kind of very very consistent over time? Um, like, would there even ever be a situation where like it says twenty minutes, then you get into the car, and then something changes somewhere, and it jumps up to forty minute uh, ETA? Yeah, I think those kinds of situations have to do with uh, traffic, right? So mm. we can give you an ETA prediction. Um, and, and I think the way to, to solve for those kinds of things is to, and it's something we're looking into currently, is how do we augment the uh, sensitivity of the ETA predictions to, to traffic? So we do get the prediction from the routing engine, which takes traffic into account. And you could argue that it's sufficient for, for traffic because it's finding the shortest path and telling you how long the shortest path is going to take. But maybe there could still be room to add traffic information to the model and, and gain uh, better insight into what might happen over the short term like that. Gotcha. Uh, we actually had a, another question from chat very related to that from a Diksha goal. Um, so how do you kind of use those real-time traffic uh, observations? Is it just in the routing engine or uh, do you use it as features? Um, they they also have a question. Uh, so you mentioned one of one of the the challenges is is all the different routes um, that that you could take. Uh, kind of what is the role of traffic in selecting those routes, um, and then how does that kind of bounce forward to to your uh, residual predictions? Okay, I guess Shinji is not taking this one. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the the, the routing engine, uh, I think there's like a blog, blog post on it. Uh, it aggregates GPS measurements from cars and it sees how long it takes cars to cross the road. And um, those are used to update estimates about, you know, just like when you look on Google Maps, you see a one segment might be highlighted in red. We have a very similar system at Uber that's trying to track the state of each of these segments. And uh, so we track traffic at the segment level, but then when route finding happens, it uses that traffic map to find kind of the best route through the city. And then it returns an ETA based on that traffic information and that gets passed to the model. Gotcha. Um, another question also from Deeksha. So this is more about uh, when you notice errors for this ETA system um, in production, uh, do you have a system to kind of correct those things? Um, or uh, like how fast is, I guess, the turnaround between noticing maybe some like errors or system systemic errors or um, uh, uh, there, they may, there may also be situations where like some, some unique event is happening um, in, in a particular city. Do you kind of have a real time system to, to go in and correct those um, and kind of what does that process look like? Yeah, we do. So we didn't talk about this in the presentation, but Uber does have uh, 
a real-time calibration system. So if you're familiar with the process of calibrating models, a lot of times when you train them, they're not a reliable uh, literal indicator of like what the conditional uh, label would be. So you, you calibrate them, right? And you know, with, with the, the DPTA model, once we deploy it, there could be things that happen that cause ETAs to be off like in the whole city and real-time calibration corrects for that. Uh, and you know, initially it was like a very simple process that just looks at recent outcomes. Like we're tracking the recent actual arrival times and comparing them to what came out of the, the model. And if to the extent that there's a gap, we apply a correction in real time to close it. And it's really helpful for you know, things like holidays or special events, as you mentioned. And it's grown in complexity over time to, to be a bit more fine-grained. Gotcha. Um, yeah, that, that's really interesting. Uh, I wanted to get in one more audience question um, from Anthony Bell. Uh, this is, a, I guess, more, a bit more technical. Uh, how do you kind of learn the geohash embeddings? And um, in that embedding space, are the points that are kind of close together in real life, or are they also close together in embedding space? Or do you see uh, kind of other like emergent behaviors start coming up? Like I can imagine that uh, maybe a city center um, could have a certain, could be in a certain place in an embedding space um, that, that would be potentially very different from a street, you know, two streets over that has a very different um, kind of traffic profile. Sorry, I missed the first question, but second, so for the embedding, we do see the cluster uh, effect. So um, I have shown several like embedding polarization. So for example, we can see certain clusters um, that's corresponding to the, the real locations and, uh, uh, and also the cluster vary a little bit um, compared to red trip, compared red trip to uh, delivery trip. And also we can see among different clusters, uh, for example, the speed uh, level is kind of different between each cluster. So uh, we do see certain pattern for the, the, the geohash embedding. Gotcha. So you would expect kind of uh, maybe a bit more, uh, I'm not sure if I want to call it like semantic relationships, um, but you wouldn't necessarily expect, let's say, if you have a highway right next to um, a, a city center, even though they could be very close in space, you wouldn't necessarily expect them to be in very similar parts of the embedding space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say the embedding space definitely is an interaction between um, like special temporal component. Um, so um, the, the figure I show is just look at like two dimensional. So um, conditional on, um, for example, given fix of time, look at the, the, uh, the geo embedding and given geo embedding, fix that, uh, look at the, the time embedding. So, so I would definitely see there will be some interaction between, between those two. So we would see, observe like more, maybe more complex pattern, especially taking to consider the special temporal and the traffic conditions. Gotcha. Yeah, but also because we're modeling a residual, you might not see like, you might not be able to do a multi-dimensional scaling and get back a map of San Francisco because it's really focusing on where are the deviations, right? Rather than what is the ETA. Um, I wanted to kind of ask, given that you guys have looked closely at probably many different cities, um, embedding patterns and trying to tune these models across these cities, are there aspects of cities that you feel makes one harder to predict? So you, you when you say hard to predict, you mean higher error or? Yeah, yeah. What, what, what's kind of like, you know, which maybe you can tell us which cities do you find the hardest to predict? Yeah, so because we do have a global model, so we have global data, so we are not actually let the, we do have the feature indicator where like which city that is, but we don't, the model does not like focus on one particular um, city or it's just a global embedding. So if in that sense, we actually always like, don't have like the worst or hardest city to predict. It's always in the, the average, the worst case is the average. So it's not like, um, will not be like significantly worse than the, the rest. I would add to that, that cities, like places that have poorer map data, you know, because they're maybe not as developed might 
uh, be more difficult to just find routes through and predict ETAs. They also tend to have a lot uh, harder traffic. Actually, you know, to, to add to that, I think it's also potentially interesting to see if in the end the model, um, how let's say, um, susceptible it is to the actual amount of data in cities. Like, did you see that if like in big cities, you can do much better because you have more data or smaller cities or, or any, any other pattern like that by any chance? Definitely more data, it performs better. <laughs> it, it, I mean, yeah, for you, we have to solve for various segments and we didn't necessarily list out the segments in this presentation, but uh, yeah, segments that don't have if we were to create a new segment for some new business that doesn't have as much data, it's not going to perform as well until we can collect more data. Um, I, I have a, I guess, maybe a more general question. Uh, given the fact that, you know, it seems like the ETA predictions working really well. Um, so what's, what's next? Are you still kind of thinking about how to improve these? Is there still room to make them better or uh, you know, what are some of the exciting new things that we should expect from uh, some of the research at Uber? Well, yeah, we are continuing to. Uh, so this is one of those models that's like super business critical. And so there's a full time team of people that are just working. And we, we have a sprint model where, you know, every six weeks we brainstorm, OK, what are we going to try next to improve things? And uh, people work on their ideas and, and share their experiments. And at the end of the sprint, we combine all the ideas together uh, and then you know, launch that into shadow as, as a potential new candidate. Um, but longer term, uh, so there are things that uh, we're interested in. And one of the things that uh, Shuni mentioned at the end of the talk, like how can we better model traffic both at the trip level, but also at the segment level? Um, and how can we integrate uh, insights from graph learning at the segment level and at the trip level? So in a nutshell, those are two of the frontiers that, that we're exploring. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sure we're all pretty excited to, to see those and um, you know, have you back on when, when we uh, get some new, new models uh, in production. Uh, I want to thank you uh, folks for joining today. Um, and I also want to thank our audience for tuning in. Before we do that, okay, um, yeah. in the in the pre-show, Piero was promising that OJ tells really great jokes. Um, we we were wondering if uh, I, I think I, I sent you a message in the chat to, to have one or two prepped. So we were wondering um, <laughs> where we're going to put Piero's reputation on the line here. Um, uh, let, let's hear maybe your best one or two jokes uh, for for the live internet audience. Sorry, I don't actually have a joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jen, you're, 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 you know, it's my reputation here. Sorry, you're destroying me with this. No, no, no. I, I don't have like a repertoire of jokes. It's just I'll say funny things in the moment, but I, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm feeling uh, last week Piero tr uh, uh, challenged me to a to a cooking contest. I'm feeling a little bit better now. Um, you know, now that his uh, uh, there this is one ding against his reputation. We'll see if the the Asian from Indiana can can uh, outperform the Italian in our Iron Chef okay. contest this summer. Okay, okay, I have to regain my reputation through that. I, uh, Are you going to be making spaghetti carbonara? Yeah, yeah, that's going to be okay. That's, that's your go-to killer. You're going to like win with that Iron Chef. <laughs> All right. Now OJ's reputation is on the line as well. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, thank, thanks for folks on YouTube for tuning in. Go to our website, mlsys.stanford.edu. Uh, subscribe to our channel. Uh, we are trying to hit 10K subs, and we're inching closer. Um, and hopefully you'll get there by the end of summer. Oh, we'll see. Um, and next week, who do we have then? We have next week we've got uh, Alkis Palazotis from uh, Databricks. Um, so I don't think he's told us what he's talking about yet, but I'm sure it'll be great. All right, awesome. Thanks everyone.